All right, World History 9, I'm walking around outside my condo, thinking about how I'm going to introduce China to you, talking to an iPhone alone, looking like a complete weirdo to any passers-by. But I think I came up with a pretty good intro. It's a way to sort of review you and at the same time connect you, review what, uh, what it means to be a good person to the Hindus, to the Jews, to who else? Well, that's as far as we've gotten so far. What does it mean to be a good person to uh, the Hindus? If a couple of words really should pop into your mind, and one of them would be Dharma, which was in your reading, because Dharma is the moral code, and it's a really interesting and distinctive one. It's a special one for India, because there's not just one way to be good. In fact, there are at least four, and more than that, actually, as you read. And yet, I'm teasing you because I want you to go back into your memory and try to remember. What is Dharma based on? Yeah, it's a, it's a code of principles that are supposed to guide your behavior and your action, but what's good for one type of person is not good for another type of person. If you haven't come up with the answer yet, know this because it's really important to understand it. Your dharma is based on what caste you were born in. So to be a good kshatriya, a good warrior caste person, you're going to follow one sort of set of rules. To be a good brahmin, brahmin, a priestly caste, you're going to follow another set of rules. Dharma is your path, your, your, your moral code, and it's how you satisfy the moral code of your particular caste that you were born into and cannot get out of that defines whether you are good or not. And what's your reward for following your dharma, no matter how high or low on the caste system you are? When you die, you get the reward of being reincarnated, hopefully into a better caste. And if you're really, really, over many, many, many reincarnations, continue following that dharma, then the ultimate reward is moksha. M-O-K-S-H-A. I believe this is in your reading, but you should know it anyway. Which is a release from being reincarnated at all. And you go back to Brahman, B-R-A-H-M-A-N, the ultimate god. He's not separate from the universe the way the Jewish God, and Christian and Muslim God is, who created the universe as a different thing. Brahman is actually in every atom of the universe, including every atom made of you and me. And so according to Hindu mythology, we are all part of, we have God in us, we have Brahman in us, and we have just forgotten about it because we have sunk so low in our consciousness that we have forgotten that we really are all part of the one true God, uh, Brahman. So that's what it means to be a good person in Hinduism. You follow your dharma and you get rewarded through reincarnation. With good karma, that takes you to a higher level. Karma is kind of the cause and effect of how closely you follow dharma. If you follow it well, your karma is good. You get rewarded next, you know, you die, you come back in a better life next time. You don't follow your dharma, you got bad karma. What does it mean to be a good person? Shifting now to our next religion that we studied, if you are a Hebrew, a Jew, an Old Testament monotheist. As we saw suggested by close reading of, uh, of the, uh, the Genesis Noah flood narrative, God chose Noah because he was righteous, which is a moral category, but then he goes on to, okay, so what does it mean to be righteous? Well, we see, reading closely again, that the one specific bit of detail that helps us get a little bit more focus and clarification on what that is, is he walked with God, meaning he walked in the path of God. So a good person in this priest-based society is one who obeys really the first commandment, and yes, all the other ones, but the first one's really important. Close reading, the very first one is, you shall have no other God before me. I'm the only God. You cannot honor any other gods. And so, mono, one, theism, God. Monotheism is born with Judaism. And to be a good man means you are obedient to God and you worship only that God. So now let's turn to China. And I'm going to take about 10, 15 minutes 
to tell you how distinctive and different China's is and hope that you, A, trust me and believe me, B, challenge me if you don't, and I'll try to justify my answers with evidence, and C, enjoy it, because uh, it's, it's radically different. Now, how can I introduce this? You read in your China packet, your empire's packet, where did you read it? I don't remember. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Shangdi was the, uh, the, Hindu, uh, the, the, the earliest Chinese god from the Shang dynasty. Now it's time to bust out our dynasty song. No, I've got it on another movie. I'll just give it to you on the other movie. It's, it's a two-minute video. The Shang dynasty was the earliest, 1600 to around 1000. This is China's first river valley civilization, its first complex society. That's when you studied it, when you studied Egypt and India and what? The Indus River and, um, and China. So the Shang dynasty is the first cities in China. They're completely separate geographically from the rest of Eurasia because of deserts and mountains. So everything that happens in China is pretty much sealed off from the, it may as well be an island because it is so isolated by deserts, mountains, rivers, not rivers, uh, oceans and so forth, that everything about China is radically different from the stuff that you see in the other three first civilizations, the Tigris, Euphrates, the Nile, and the, the Indus, because as you know now, those three had contact and cultural diffusion because of uh, the Age of Empires. Alexander and the Greeks, they went through the Tigris Euphrates and on down to Indus, right? So they all cross-influenced each other through cultural diffusion. But China was separate from India because of the Himalayas. It was separate from Europe because of the, um, the Hindu Kush and many deserts and all sorts of stuff. So, so China was completely separate. Again, it may as well have been an island. So the first civilization, the Shang Dynasty, as you read in that first civilization's packet, they worshipped a god called Shangdi, S-H-A-N-G-D-I, Shangdi. And Shangdi was a he, and he was up there in what the Chinese equivalent of heaven was. But differently, he was surrounded by the dead ancestors of the Shang family king's line. And so... The Shang believed that the only way to make Di, Shang Di, the god, be good to the king and the, and the country was to perform ancestor rituals to the spirits of the king's dead ancestors. For some reason, they didn't think it was possible to talk directly to Shang Di. Instead, they had to, like, do good to their dead ancestors, their dead grandparents, great-grandparents, going back 600 years by the end of it. And the dead ancestors up there in heaven along with Shangdi would say, hey, Shangdi, they give a really good sacrifice, good food, good incense, good wine, good music. They performed all the rituals really properly. They took it seriously. So do good for them. Give them a good harvest. Help them win whatever war with whatever neighboring tribe is going on down there, a neighboring city. That's Shang religion. Notice that we have the fourth, <laughs> the fourth major civilization uh, in Eurasia, with a he up there too. The Shang lasted until around a thousand, about the same time of Jerusalem being founded, when their last kings were so corrupt and so uncaring for the people that the Zhou Dynasty, which was one of their subject states, it was a state inside of the Shang kingdom, loyal to the Shang kingdom, but the people got so sick of the last Shang kings that they started leaving and gathering around the Zhou state, because the Zhou king, or the Zhou prince, duke, was a really nice, caring, able administrator and decent person, and the people liked living under him, so they went to his state. Until finally they started saying, look, we want you to, we want you to, to overthrow the Shang King. Well, the Shang King is as close as you can get in China. You tell me what he is. Oh, when the, when the, this is important. When the, 
<laughs> when the Shang King satis tried to satisfy his ancestors so that they would tell Shang Di, the god up there, that, uh, you know, do good stuff, he didn't have priests serving God for him. He did the sacrifices, and when they did, maybe some of you have heard of these oracle bones, these turtle shells and, and cattle shoulder blades that they used to ride on, questions to D, saying, hey D, this toothache I have, is it because my ancestors are mad at me? Hey D, is next Thursday a good day to go to war? Will I win? Hey D, is my wife or concubine going to have a male son, a, a baby, a male? All sort of thing. The person who answered, and then they would like heat up this, this metal rod and stick it onto this bone, and it would crack, and they would read the cracks. But they wrote all their questions in the same Chinese, pretty much, that we read today. And this is 4,000 years ago, which is deep and cool. The kings had the questions written by some uh, assistants, but who read the cracks and interpreted them? The king himself. Who performed the ceremonies of sacrifice? To the ancestors, the king himself, not priests. So underline that, write it down, and say wow, because you've seen that in, China, in, in India, the top of the pyramid is the priests. You've seen that in Judaism, in Israel, political power lies with the priests because they are the ones who serve at the temple and protect God's law because law comes from God, not from men. Here in China, there's no priest, no, no priest class. It's unique that way. Instead, politics and religion are bound up in one. The king himself is a priest. Who cares? Mr. Brillis is so boring. Wipe the cobwebs from your eyes and hear what a radical difference that would make to a civilization. What sort of problems does a king have when there are powerful representatives of God, who the people fear and follow, when the king makes unpopular decisions that the priests don't like, power is going to be divided. When we get to Europe in the Middle Ages after the Roman Empire, you'll see that it's popes versus kings struggling for power. And that's one of the reasons that Europe stayed such a mess for so long during the Dark Ages. They had a strong priest class. China had none. King and, and serving as the ritual priest, it was all in the role of the king, here the Shang. So now the Zhou is going to kill this guy, and he's basically as close to a pope as you'll get in Chinese history. And if they kill him, then everybody believes that it's going to totally anger his ancestors, who are the ones who talk to D. And so the Zhou are like, how can we make the people not hate us and think that we're totally evil? for killing the Pope, the Chinese Pope, the Shang King. And there are two answers to this that are distinctive and fascinating. Distinctive means unique, original. One of them is that the Zhou, Z-H-O-U, Sha Shang Zhou, we're doing Shang and Zhou. Zhou Revolution. The Zhou were a little state out to the west. They were, they were like frontier, cowboy sort of state. They're, one of their major jobs was to raise horses that they got from the Central Asian desert people, the nomads, they raised horses and bred them for the Shang kings down there in the, the city life, the farming life on the, on the Yellow River. So they were kind of frontier people, kind of cowboy types. And they were a separate, uh, sort of a separate tribe. They had their own culture because this is the beginnings of civilization. People are roaming around all over the place as hunter-gatherers and then as, as um, you know, agricultural places. Well, these people were separate. They, they had their own cultures, their own beliefs, and the Joe had a different belief system. And theirs, in theirs, there was no God at all. They didn't worship anybody named he or she up there in the sky. Instead, they only thought of this thing called Tian, T-I-A-N. Westerners translate it heaven. That's really dangerous because that translation invites all sorts of comparisons and assumptions that it's something like the, the Western heaven. It's nothing like it at all. A, a, a really more correct way to translate it so that you keep the differences clear is simply sky. But in any case, what the, um, what the Joe explained to the people to justify and legitimate their murder and military revolution against the Shang was that Tian, heaven, 
despite this king's ancestors, was ashamed of this king because Tien, this godless sky, basically nature and the universe, the, you know, the cosmos, Tien has a moral law every bit as much as it has other invisible things like forces of gravity. Do you hear how radically different that is? The Joe belief in heaven, Tien, sky, as a moral force in the natural universe that requires no God and has written no book, but is based on how well you treat your people if you're king. If you treat them badly, heaven will overthrow you. Nature will overthrow you. So nature has this moral force in it, like the force of gravity, that has nothing to do with any sort of he or she up there, or them, if you're polytheist. But it's more moral in a very political way than any other religion. And so the Joe, through this, this idea of Tian, and some scholars think that it was actually, you know, sort of Joe propaganda. You know, how can we make these people support us? We need to come up with a really persuasive idea here, advertising campaign. They came up with what is called the mandate of heaven. Mandate means, um, you know, mandatory, like it must happen. Um, it, so heaven wills it. Heaven wants it. Heaven demands it. Mandate, demand, that's good. Heaven demands that bad kings be killed by good men who will start a new dynasty, a new family that rules, father to son, father to, uh, you know, older brother to younger brother, whatever. Dynasty means generations of the same family ruling by birth. And so that's, what, that's how the Joe dynasty started. And they said, we are going to rule according to um, this moral law of Tien. And we must be good to the people if we want to keep our power. If we don't, then the people have the right to rebel, rise up, and overthrow us militarily. And that's radical. They're not there because God wants them to be there forever. They're only good, I'm sorry, heaven wants them to be there forever. They're only there as long as their family line rules caring about the people and not being selfish, corrupt, luxurious, uncaring, pigs. That's the mandate of heaven. So the two main concepts here are this transition, this change over time, radical, radical change over time from Shang to Zhou when Shang Di dies with the last Zhou king, the belief in him, and is replaced by this non-theistic, atheistic notion of Tian that while being godless is still at the same paradoxical time, very moral. Crazier still, in a mostly political way. All right, so that's point one. Confucius and the Taoists and the legalists, they all lived during the Zhou dynasty. So this is, again, the age of the great religions, except they're not religions at all. They're philosophies, ethical philosophies mostly, um, that popped up during China and still count today, right? So the Zhou dynasty, the early stages were the first 300 years from 1,050 to, say, 770. You don't really have to know the dates, but, it, you know, I find it helps anyway. The first 300 years of the Zhou dynasty were good years. They're considered the golden years. And the Zhou ruled through being benevolent, which means good-willed, like, you know, compassionate, and through performing these, these uh, still these ancestor rituals. Now, if you're listening and if you're interested and if you've got fire between your ears, you're saying... Why would they be performing ancestor rituals if there's still no if they they've overthrown this idea of a D up there, a Shang D up there? Well, the ancestor rituals have gone back in China forever and ever as something that every single family does. The closest thing that China gets to religion is the idea of family. Take out the word God and insert the word family, and you're starting to understand how important family is to China. So when China asks the questions, what does it mean to be a good person, a good man, a good woman, a good boy, a good girl, it has nothing to do with belief at all. Not, not what you think is true about what came before you and what happens after you and who started it all and how it's all going to end and, you know, is the earth round or flat? None of it. It's not about truth and false. It's about action, ethics, your behavior. And since family is at the center of it, your behavior is defined to be good when you are 
a good son to your father or daughter, father to your son or daughter, brother to your brother or sister, friend to your friend, and subject to your king, and vice versa. Every one of those what are called five relationships, they involve inequality and hierarchy. Older has authority over younger, parent over child, man over woman, subject, uh, king over subject. But at the same time, they involve responsibility from the top down of benevolence, of goodwill, of compassion, of being basically a good person to them, caring for them and taking care of them. Uh, I'm sorry, to a lot of modern Chinese, Confucianism seems really undemocratic and run, really unequal and even like oppressive, tyrannical. Um, you know, men have the power, older people have the power, all this sort of thing. It's not democratic. People aren't equal. And so they judge that really harshly and negatively. But one thing that they, I argue, don't appreciate is that the relationships in those five relationships are mutual. They're reciprocal. They go back and forth. And that is the glue and the foundation of what a good person is. It is really the wrong way to say it. It's not the good person. It's the person performing all of their roles, role as father, as son, as sister, as brother, as subject to the king, as king to the subject, all of those. Each one of us has a role. I'm a son. I'm a husband. I'm a teacher, an authority towards you, all that sort of thing. So, yeah, I've got authority over many aspects of my life, but at the same time, I've got the responsibility to be a good authority. And, of course, I guess the closest thing then that we can come to the, the notion of sin or evil in China is the notion of somebody who does not honor that reciprocal responsibility to be good to the person they have authority over. All right. So to sort of wrap up here, the last thing to say is that the way that all of, this, all of these relationships stayed together in the in the Joe dynasty was through ritual. Ritual means those, maybe you've seen them, and I'll show them to you in class. Actually, Google it right now. Shang bronzes, S-H-A-N-G, bronze, B-R-O-N-Z-E-S. And you'll see all these cool, old-looking metal vessels, big, massive pots and, uh, and wine cups on three legs and all sorts of stuff made of bronze that were used not just to have dinner at night, but only when you were performing a ritual of some sort. And those rituals had very precise rules and music and all sorts of stuff, and it was all in order to, yes, honor your ancestors usually, but other things too. Um, so it was through ritual, not through rules, not through laws, not through commandments, but through ritual that people showed their respect for each other in all of their roles. And again, each one of us has many roles inside of us. And so all of those roles would come out when you were in a group, normally family, sometimes more. Sometimes the king would have rituals with all of his subjects, and they would listen to, he would put on concerts, believe it or not, and play these massive, cool bronze bells um, and other ancient Chinese instruments. And, uh, and it was all of, the, all of the, the city together with this big, lavish concert that the king would put on. Maybe kind of like a Fourth of July or, or National Day celebration here today when the government does it to bring the people together. But um, yeah, cool stuff. So we have talked about the mandate of heaven, about how Shang became Shangdi became Tian, and um, and how morality has nothing to do with commandments or rules or laws, mind you, but with instead performing a good role. I guess the last term that you would want to know is filial piety. Filial means being a son, and piety means being worshipful or respectful, reverent. Reverence is a better word, respectful, honoring. So you're honoring your parents. You're honoring those older than you, that sort of thing.